Hi, and welcome to In the Studio. I'm Tyler Schaffo. Today my guests are Lynn Kimsey and Stephen Hayden, the director and collection manager, respectively, of the Bohart Museum of Entomology. Uh, we've also brought along some other very special guests that you can see here. Uh, but let's start with the museum itself. Um, Lynn, can you tell me what is the Bohart Museum? Uh, the Bohart Museum is a uh started out as a collection of insects, spiders, you know, related things mm -hmm. in about 1947. And we've been growing ever since then. Now we have public programs as well as research programs and do a lot of diagnostic services and other things for the public. So it's an educational outreach as well as a research institution. Yes, but, and equally important in both directions. So, I mean, we really value taking insects to the public, mm -hmm. you know, getting people comfortable with insects and spiders like Rosie and, and just informing them, especially kids. It's, it's lots of fun to work with kids. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, and we'll get to Rosie in a, in a little bit. Um, Steve, uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about uh, what a collections manager does at, uh, what is your role in the museum? Well, basically, I'm there day to day to operate the museums and just facilitate things happening there. I mean, there's mundane things like ordering stuff. And then a lot of times people will bring in an insect they need identified, and I do that. And supervise scientific visitors, and we have a lot of student assistants that work for us, so I train and supervise them and just sort of basically keep the place running. Wow, yeah. I imagine that's a big job. Yeah, it's, uh, we have about 8 million specimens in our museum, which makes it one of the larger collections in North America. So it's, it's a very busy place between outreach, um, student projects, and working, and then also adding new materials to our collections. And I imagine a lot of those specimens look like what you've brought in here on the, the beetle board here. Is that... Is that true? Well, sadly, no. Sadly, <laughs> no. The size, the size of the average insect is only like three or four or five millimeters in length. Oh, yeah. So, so something. These are the more spectacular ones that we bring out to show because if we camera. showed a little tiny bug, no one would pay any attention. So yeah. that's, uh, that's kind of a shame because there's a lot of amazing things found on that scale, isn't there? Yeah, and the diversity is, is immense and Scientifically, the place you're going to find the new species will be in the smaller stuff. Most of the bigger stuff has already been found and described. Sure, sure. Yeah. I imagine so. Well, um, speaking of, of bigger stuff, I, I've, been so ex I've been excited about this all week. So I was wondering, Lynn, if you could introduce us to some of, uh, some of the other guests that you've brought today. Well, we brought Rosie, who's a rose hair tarantula, and she's kind of our ambassador because Rosie's very calm. She doesn't get excited, so she's the perfect way of getting people comfortable with spiders. So yeah. we can handle her. She just calmly sits there, and probably in picnic day, which is the big campus open house, mm -hmm. she's held by 400 people. Wow. So she's very patient. She's a trooper. She's also old. So and this tarantula is probably somewhere around 23 years old. 23 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, for scale, how, how long would that be on, on a typical tarantula lifespan? You know, in captivity, they live quite a long time, the females at least, which is what Rosie is. I see, yeah. The, uh, in the wild, probably half that. Half of that. Yeah, but they're still long-lived animals. Wow. Yeah. yeah, for for an insect, I would imagine. No, no, know. she's a spider. Come on. Ah, right, of course. You <laughs> caught me. You caught me. There's a difference of two legs. <laughs> sure, of course. So as as an arachnid, as an as an arthropod or whatever, uh, then that would be even twelve years, you say about yeah, half years. would would be Still. a long time. Yeah, yeah. Because they have predators. I mean they're things that like to eat them, including people. Sure. And there are parasites. Strange people. <laughs> well, it depends on where you live, but yeah. So, yeah. yeah, it could be. Uh, but 
yeah, there are just lots of things that can happen to them. They have to shed their skin to grow, just like insects do. Mm -hmm. Accidents happen when that takes place because they're mm -hmm. very vulnerable. And so sometimes they just never make it as long as she does. But uh, she's quite old. Yeah, and, and uh, you mentioned predators. And uh, what other predators would those be? Like snakes, things like birds? Um, rodents. Rodents. Birds, maybe. Um, they have that big wasp called the tarantula hawk. The tarantula hawk, okay. Which yeah. specializes in these in the wild. And so, you know, you have a diversity of things. And there are actual parasites. There are some flies and other things that actually parasitize them and will lay eggs on Interesting. them. Interesting, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, great. Well, do you think uh, Rosie would mind being handled by one more person today? I doubt it. You want to get her out? <laughs> sure. He'll have to end up crossing in front of me. So these are actually native to Chile, and I've been in the forests where they come from, and the environment is kind of like what you would get uh, around Seattle. Really? It's kind of rainy and humid, and uh, I was just sitting on a log there, and and you would see this little flurry of movement over the here, and there would be one crawling along, and then there would be a little movement over there, and there was another one. So they can be quite, uh, quite common in the environment that they live in. And um, what is the name of this particular species? It's the Chilean rosehair tarantula. I imagine that's where its name comes from, right? right? Yeah. yeah, it's Chilean got rosehair. Kind of a nice rose color on the on the back of the cephalothorax. You can see it's got a little rosy blush on the hair. Mm -hmm. Sure enough. Let me see if it's possible to get a close-up for our viewers there. Let me, uh, oop, there we go. And uh, yeah, you can see just just a little bit of that blush, like mm -hmm. you said. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool, pretty cool. I think a lot of people think of uh, tarantulas, and maybe this is an error, as um, something from an arid climate. But you say these are from some uh, a rainforest type climate. Is that true? Well, we're kind of biased because yeah. the North American tarantulas do tend to be arid creatures. Mm -hmm. But if you go south <laughs> to Brazil or any place like that, yeah. you'll find a lot of them in the tropical forest. A lot in the, and and I imagine that's because so there's wanna... there's an abundance of of food resources there in the in the rainforest. Yeah, yeah, and there's also a lot of different places to live. Like there's some species that specialize, they live in burrows in the ground, and then there's other kinds that live up in the tree canopy and may never come to the ground. Wow. Yeah, some of in these their, do live up in the trees. In their whole life cycle they would never they would never come out of the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. That's really cool. And um I'm sure a lot of a lot of viewers are wondering. Um, this species obviously isn't venomous. Is that is that true, or at least not to people? Not to people. Not to people. All spiders are venomous. All spiders. That's how are they catch their food. Mm -hmm. So it's just that we don't react to all of the venom. I see. So with these, it's going to hurt because of the mechanical sharpness more than the venom. A bite, just like a bite from a cat would hurt. Exactly. But Probably about that hard, too. Wow. Yeah. And uh, it, so I assume you've been bitten. No, not by these. We, not by these. No. Mm -mm. We, don't, we don't handle the... We have some that are very aggressive mm -hmm. and probably quite venomous because they actually feed on birds, but n none of the ones we handle are like that. Hmm. These little guys, they eat crickets and things like that, so... Yeah. So they've they've become more docile because of their no. because of their. Uh... They're just it is what it is. You can see this is a vicious beast. Yes, and, <laughs> very much so. And, and she's just <laughs> sitting there, kind of hanging out, and that's what they do. Most of them, um, they sit in burrows and just wait for something to come by. Yeah. So they're they're very passive hunters. Passive hunters. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a it's a trap. Mm -hmm. they, in a sense. In yeah. The, okay. Or they're they're. They're called sessel predators, which means sessel. that they simply sit and wait for something to come to them. Okay. Kind of like praying mantids, they do the same thing. All right, so that yeah. would be another another yeah. example. Yeah, yeah. Really cool, really yeah. cool. No, they're really nice. So, you know, but 
they're all different kinds. There are probably anywhere from two to 12 species in California of tarantulas. Mm -hmm. So Found throughout California or in particular areas? They're found from the Mexican border up to about on the, on the west side of the valley up to Mount Diablo, on the east side of the valley a bit further north in the mm -hmm. sort of foothills, but not in the valley floor and not on the coast. Not on the coast, yeah, I see. Yeah. But yeah, you can see how active she is. <laughs> <laughs> She's just hanging out there. She does, yes. <laughs> yeah. Soaking in the limelight. <laughs> She makes a great ambassador, though, you have to admit. Uh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Oops. It's tangled up there. Yeah, she's got a little cactus in there, but really she should have um, vines and, and uh, yeah. you know, ferns. It just meets people's expectations. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and then, and then they get to learn more about it, and they can see how those expectations are subverted. Exactly. So, so we actually keep what we call our petting zoo, which has a diversity of spiders. We have centipedes. We have several kinds of cockroaches, a bunch of walking sticks. And these are all used in classes on campus, as well as outreach programs that we do with kids. And these are some of our most popular outreach uh, acrobats, you might really say. Really cool. Where, where have been some of the places that you've, you've taken this petting zoo? Oh, where the haven't road. we taken them? <laughs> <laughs> Anywhere they'll have you, I assume. <laughs> yeah, I guess the biggest event, um, well, we've done the state fair before. That's sure. probably the, the biggest event. And the smallest event would probably be some of the Girl Scout and Brownie and Cub Scout troops so, that come into the museum. Mm -hmm. Wow, so small, a few people, to Rosie being held by 400 people at, at picnic day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All different sizes. Yeah. And then mm. we're also open to individual families um, from Monday that to Thursday that can come into the museum. Mm -hmm. And they could get a chance to, to hold a, a really cool organism like, like Rosie. Yeah. 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 Really neat. Yeah. If, yeah. Our, if there are students in there, we have a lot of student employees and sort of interns, and mm -hmm. they all help people out when they come in. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, and, and you mentioned that uh, people sometimes come in for insect identification. Is that, is that something that happens commonly? People find an interesting bug in their backyard and bring it in to see what it is? is well, that, is just, that... just this morning, someone sent me a, a live bed bug. Oh, wow. They wanted to know if it was a bed bug. And... Of course, as it crawled out of the bottle, I said, yep, <laughs> that's a bed sure bug and put the lid back on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. goodness. Ooh, now there's big bugs in, in Davis. Oh. Well, a lot of people have a certain amount of distrust of, you know, the pest management industry, and they mm -hmm. just want a second opinion, and we're happy to provide that. Right. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, sometimes it's just, I found this in my bathtub, you know, what is it? And so we help them out. And then sometimes um, there's cases with legal repercussions, like product contamination, product made one place, sold maybe in Japan or something, and mm -hmm. there's a bug in it. And if we're lucky, we can identify the species of the insect, and we can tell them whether that likely got in at the user's end or the manufacturer's mm -hmm. end. Wow. And, and you would be able to tell that from the... Uh, environment that, that that insect is native to? Is that is that how you would Well we had out? yeah we had one medical device that was made in Malta and sort of assembled in the Bay Area and then used in Taiwan. And it had a kind of an ant that's a tropical ant. Mm. So that ant could have only gotten in in, in Taiwan. Right. Okay. So we were able to let the manufacturer off the hook because obviously it was a, a contaminant at the end of the chain rather than at the beginning. Wow, it's it's such a gamut of services that that you all provide. That's that's really cool. Speaking of uh, things that some people think of as pests, can we can we maybe introduce our next off to our the next cockroaches? <laughs> now uh, I know these these aren't. Uh, quite the same as as what we might think of as uh, the the cockroaches that we might be familiar with here, 
or in I New York. I hope not. I hope not, because it means they've gotten loose from, from the Bohart Museum, doesn't it? <laughs> well, there's actually, I don't know how many thousand different species of cockroaches, and really there's only about a dozen that ever cause trouble in people's houses. And this is one that lives in uh, Madagascar, and it's called the Madagascar hissing cockroach because, uh, well, if you get a wild one that's not used to being picked up, they'll make a rather loud hissing noise when you first pick them up. And how do they make that hissing noise? Because they don't have mouths and lungs sort of like we do. Is that, isn't that right? Right. Well, they have a, what look like a row of portholes that go down the side of the, the abdomen. Mm -hmm. And when they contract their abdominal muscles, it forces the air out through those holes, which is the respiratory system, and it makes that hissing noise. Wow. So, but the thing you have to understand about cockroaches is they can't hear. They can't hear? No. Deaf as posts. Right? So if they're making this noise, it's just for you hmm. because they can feel it. But say if you saw a cockroach in your kitchen and you yelled at that cockroach, that cockroach is going to sit there going, my, the wind's blowing. <laughs> They can't hear it. They might feel vibrations. They'll feel maybe the air movement, mm -hmm. but that's all. So if you made a noise that caused vibrations through the surface they're standing on, they'll feel that. And oh. so they can feel it when they hiss, but they don't hear it because they have no ear structure of any kind. Most insects can't hear. Fascinating. So you said the, the hissing would be for me. Is that Get a startle me? response. You pick it up, it goes hiss, you drop it. And I'm less likely to prey upon it. So if you were a bird, it, for example. If I was a bird. Right. Um, yeah. They also do this when they are all aggregated. It's a way of signaling each other because they can feel it. So it's also a social behavior? Yeah. Yeah. How, how social are, are these insects? Do they live in colonies? They live in small colonies. The males are very territorial, so they will hiss at each other. As, as like a mating ritual? As a sort of, this is my territory, I'm bigger and louder than you are, so just back off. Right? Wow. You know, and they'll do headbutts. So the males, oh, did we bring them Just male? the way like, oh, like mountain rams will, right? Yeah, the males actually, we didn't bring a, a male, but right here on the front they'll have two knobs. So you can tell them apart pretty easily. These are a couple of fascinating, fascinating. chubby females. Could I, get, could I get a chance to, to hold these guys? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, the other reason we like to use them in the museum is because they're slow moving. So right. the, they're not going to do a mad dash out of a little kid's hand. Oh, come on. There we go. <laughs> they're, they were on their, on their side there. Let's get, a, let's get a good close up for the audience. They're also interesting because the females retain the eggs inside the body until just before they're ready to hatch. So that top one that's really fat is probably fairly pregnant. Wow. And so, then, yeah, so they give live birth. They don't live lay birth. eggs. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. How unusual is that in, in the insect world? It's not common. It, it shows up here and there. More, more among cockroaches, or is this unique among cockroaches? Um, the entire family that they belong to does this. There are certain flies, like flesh flies, that do this. Uh, it shows up here and there. It's not really a, a common thing, but it's also not really super rare. Fascinating, yeah. fascinating. I want to make sure we get to our, our last guest before he escapes. <laughs> um, he's, he's made it from one box to, uh, to the second. Your last guest is very hungry, which is why it's moving around so much. <laughs> is that right? Is that right? I want to oh, here. go ahead and drop these off. You just Ooh. scrape them off. It's oh, okay. there we go. Yeah. They're pretty. They're kind of, yeah, they're fine. Hard to mess up. <laughs> so this I've, is a I've, kind of walking stick from Australia, and it eats uh, eucalyptus. So this is a... You'd find this in the same place you'd find a koala, because koala also eat only eucalyptus. It must be a, a buzz of activity on those trees. Yeah, it takes a lot of specialization to be able to eat eucalyptus. It's really nasty stuff. 
It ha does it have chemical defenses that... Well, you know what the smell is, right? When you crush eucalyptus leaves, you get that sure, powerful yeah, odor. Has, well, has that's a... actually quite okay. toxic. Really? And so things like these guys and like koalas that feed on them have to have special ways of dealing with those compounds because they really are not very good for them. <laughs> Fascinating. I wonder why, uh, what was the Im evolutionary impetus to go, over, go after eucalyptus instead of something something easier because it's there because it's there and a lot of it so a lot of things in Australia eat eucalyptus but you notice in California where we have a lot of eucalyptus there are very very few things and they've only really shown up in the last 20 years from Australia hmm. none of the native things can eat it and if you look at eucalyptus trees often there's not even any weeds growing underneath them Wow, because their chemical defenses are so powerful so powerful yeah. and they're yeah. the toxin that they have in there is it in the leaves or in the bark? It's Both. in everything. It's the whole thing. But the leaves are very potent. Yeah. Wow, yeah. wow. But these guys, specially They have specially special guts that handle it just fine. Yeah. Wow, and, and I think everybody can see how, how well they would camouflage into yeah. uh, that kind of vegetation. See, see what I'm doing now is, is it's trying to climb so sure. it's not really being affectionate or anything, it's just trying to climb up. <laughs> well, different walking sticks, there's some that look like leaves. Mm -hmm. And then there's sort of your classic stick-like ones. Right. And then there's some that uh, look like bark, so they hang out in cracks in bark. And this one, you know, it's fairly large. And a lot of times I think it looks like, a, you know, maybe just the little end of a branch that died and some leaves that curled up and dried up. I, you know, speaking of curling, you can see its, uh, its abdomen doing this curling motion. Is that, uh, is that a part of its camouflage? Probably. Or is it, yeah? Just to make it look like something not edible, right? So its whole deal is to look like dried up plant material or something like this mm -hmm. and not an insect because it really doesn't have any way of defending itself against birds or anything that wants to eat it. Wow. He definitely wants to stay on the move. Yeah. I if, keep saying he actually is this This uh, is a she. Is, if it was a he, a it would have fully developed wings. Fully developed wings, so they also fly? The males can. These the males guys fly. these guys cannot. You can see she's got little short yeah, little she short has... wings right here almost like vestigial yeah. wings there. Exactly. Wow. Really fascinating stuff. Yeah. Cool. Put her back. Um, and, and... <laughs> this one still hasn't turned over. Still hasn't turned over. Oh no. There we go. Something I was going to ask you all about, uh, while we have a, an insect expert here, um, there's a story about uh, bees that's become pretty popular in the in the media about a, a so-called bee crisis. I was wondering if um, you could tell us anything about uh, what's what's the latest happening with bees and, and disappearing. It's really complicated. Is it really complicated? Because, you know, what honeybees are experiencing now, honeybees are just one kind of bee. Mm -hmm. In the United States, there are probably more than a thousand different kinds of bees. Uh, honeybees are not native here. They were introduced by the Spanish and then later European explorers. So they're kept commercially and by the public to pollinate, to produce honey. But most of the honeybees in this country are ones that were brought in before 1900 because okay. laws were passed to, to protect the honeybees from diseases and pathogens and things so that you couldn't import any more new stock. Mm. So they're getting to be very genetically inbred. Really? One problem. Okay. Um, the other problem is parasites, so the one, very things that the law went into place to pr prevent coming into the United States, like varroa mite, tracheal mite, they got here anyway. So now we have a real big parasite problem. We have um, drought, which means that the honeybees are not getting enough decent nutrition. There's not enough bloom for them throughout the year when they're active to 
be healthy. So there's a little bit of malnourishment, especially in California when, you know, even in normal years, it's dry from about June until November. True. Right. Not, so there's nothing blooming. Which would not be ideal for. No. So for it means that they go into kinds of bees that are from native to another place. Right. At least so originally. they go into winter with poor reserves. So mm. honeybees, the reason we like them is because they have perennial colonies that last for years and they can survive winters, for example, by storing honey. So mm -hmm. that's what they eat during the winter when there's nothing else. Mm -hmm. But if they don't have enough, it means they're weak. So then the parasites can be a problem. If you're all the same, then parasites and diseases become a problem. And then there's another thing, and that is that you really can't make a new bee from just pollen and nectar. Okay. You, you have to have more. And so what they do is they have yeasts in their colonies that mix up with the pollen and the nectar and produce what's called bee bread. Bee bread. So okay. the yeasts actually produce these other compounds that the bees need. Hmm. So the bees are out flying in an orchard. They've just sprayed with a fungicide. Mm -hmm. Gets on the bee, doesn't hurt the bee. Bee comes back to the colony, it kills all the yeast. I see. I see. Right? So, so you have these, so then you're back to so malnutrition again. So it's a symbiotic again. relationship between all the, kinds of the things. bee and the yeast, and if either yes. one of those things is, is weak, yes. especially the yeast which is yeah. vulnerable, then you right. can see a colony collapse. Yeah, and it might just be nutritionally that they just can't make it through the winter. Wow. Right, so you have these different things, and then there are the insecticides, and we don't really know the full impact of those, but on top of all of these other things, I think they're really bad, mm -hmm. right? But my personal favorite explanation for the colony collapse disorder still has to be the bee rapture. Great. Where they're going to heaven. Well, oh. <laughs> the rapture. I, that rapture. I was, well, uh. on, that, on that note, <laughs> that was, that was an interesting note to end on. I, I did want to get that question in about the bees because people are so fascinated with colony collapse disorder. Um, but we are about out of time. I was really glad that we, we got to meet all of these really fascinating organisms, learn a little bit more about them. Hopefully our viewers learned something about them and they're a little less intimidated by yeah. the, the organisms that make up so much of our world. And they'll come in and visit you at the Bohart Museum of Entomology. Thank you. Yeah, we're open yeah. Monday through Thursday. And then we have, during the school year, we have one a month uh, weekend open days. Great. And, and there's a website where they can come find you at. Right. That is bohart.ucdavis.edu. Right. Dot edu. Yeah. Bohart.ucdavis.edu. I think it's on the screen there. Yeah. So everybody can go. Check you out there, mm -hmm. check you out in person, bring in a bug that uh, you found <laughs> in your backyard. Um, make sure it's not on your medical devices. <laughs> um, I think that's all the time that we have. Thank you so much for coming in, Lynn, Steve, and we'll catch you next time on In the Studio. I'm Tyler Schaffo. <laughs>